Hi, this is Yosapan Bhartiya, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Vancouver. And today, once again, we have with us Ibrahim Haddad, Vice President of Strategic Programs AI at the Linux Foundation. Ibrahim, it's great to have you back on the show in person. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah, and uh, you do so much, you know, there that it, it, we'll try to, you know, track all of what you do there. You release a lot of reports, and of course, you, uh, you know, lead a lot of efforts there. But before we talk about everything else, I want to get an update on the whole, you know, initiative efforts that are going uh, update on what is happening with LFAI and data. LFAI and data was established in the Linux Foundation about five years ago in. Um, May of 2018. And we started with the vision that there's actually a lot of interest and a lot of activities happening in open source relative to AI and data. And the goal was to bring in a lot of these efforts and provide them with a neutral environment um, that enables and fosters collaboration between the projects, between the projects and the companies and the communities. So we launched LFAI and data in 2018 with nine member companies and we had a single project that we used to anchor and launch the initiative. And throughout the years, five years later is today, almost uh, a month from today, it will be five years exactly, we have 55 member companies that are active members of the foundation, and we are up to 49 hosted projects, which is really incredible because for the past, I would say, two and a half to three years, we have been adding one new project to the foundation every single month. And in fact, we can add more. However, of course, we have the limitation of resources. Uh, otherwise, we, we can add many more projects uh, on a monthly basis. And our community of developers grew from a handful of developers to um, almost 60,000 developers active across these different projects coming from over 500 organizations. So you can see the impact of um, hosting in a foundation under a new environment under a, an open governance, uh, that has a really massive impact on the growth of the project. Um, so it's been really phenomenal and we expect to continue with this growth, especially today with all the emphasis in um, AI on open source and collaboration and accelerating innovation. And uh, actually one interesting data point is when we look at the landscape that we manage that covers the top 340, 350 projects in the ecosystem, there's a little over 1 million line of code being create, created every single week. So there is absolutely no organization out there that can beat that pace of innovation and development. Uh, so my call of action for individuals and organizations that are really listening to this uh, video is, you know, if you are involved in open source AI and data projects, please come and talk to us. There's really massive potentials for collaboration, for increased uh, innovation by working together on all of these different enabling blocks versus then you sitting and developing it yourself. So really a very exciting times in AI and data. These are because we talk about chat GPT all the time these days and uh, I mean, there's so much discussion about you know bad AI, good AI and everything else. Talk a bit about uh, when we look at, you know, the interesting thing in the, the software industry is that the hype, you know, yeah. suddenly everything gets hyped and you know, after that, uh, press finds the next shiny object and we move on. So when we are talking about this whole, you know, all these new, you know, buzzwords in the AI space, how much you're seeing is that it's being an evolution that has been happening for a while, because there are two kinds of AI or technologies. One is which is being actually used realistically in industry, which are solving a lot of problems, and one is just a buzzword. So in real, realistically, where are we heading? So uh, actually a very good question. <laughs> so um, certainly there is a lot of hype, uh, but also to counter that, there are some very significant advancement in particular areas. So it really depends on the use case. So, you know, what kind of AI technologies you want to use to solve a given problem in your supply chain, for example, or in um, managing, um, you know, your customer support. Uh, for example, I work with an organization that have over a billion subscribers. Uh, and a lot of their concerns is how can we adopt uh, different AI technologies that will help us minimize our efforts when it comes to managing uh, customer inquiries. 
Or how can we manage the supply chain of our mobile phones being sent to like hundreds of millions of customers and so on? And I think at the end of the day, uh, it's not creating technology for the sake of technology. It's more, we have a problem and we need to solve it. So what kind of technology can we collaborate on creating together to minimize our cost and accelerate our innovation and address the given problem at hand, which will solve not just my problem, but it also solve your problem and many other problems that are very similar or within the domain. So despite the, the large hype um, since the beginning of the year, of this year, 2023, there are still very significant um, technological milestone being achieved. And a lot of it is not necessarily what users see when they interact with a product or service. A lot of it is kind of embedded in different layers that are invisible. So I would take, for example, the Linux kernel as, as an amazing example, where you know the tablet you're using, my phone, uh, you know your infotainment system in a car, you know, there's a Linux kernel in all of these. It's an amazing piece of software, but it's not visible to anybody. So a lot of the innovation in AI is actually happening at these different layers that may not necessarily be visible to you, but it's there and it's being helpful. Thanks for talking about uh, AI. Now I want to switch gears to Italy and talk about in last year at, uh, I think, Dublin, uh, you know, PyTorch Foundation was also announced. Yeah. Uh, give us an update on what's going on with the foundation. So PyTorch and the PyTorch Foundation is like the most exciting thing um, you can be working on today. Um, so we launched the foundation in Dublin uh, in the fall of last year. And this is basically a massive commitment from Meta, the founding company behind the PyTorch project and its core um, supporters in terms of the project that came together and decided to go even further in opening up the project and its governance, hosting it in a foundation and provide a neutral home for it to enable uh, more companies, not just to use the project and rely on it, but also to contribute to it and feel that they have a path to become leaders in the project as they invest resources and they contribute to it. So we started uh, and we launched the initiative or the PyTorch Foundation uh, in the fall, I think September of uh, 2022. And since then we've been uh, doing a lot of work in the background. Uh, so for instance, we have uh, established the operation of the foundation within the LF. We have hired uh, two dedicated resources in addition to myself um, to be supportive uh, staff for the foundation. So now we have a dedicated head of marketing for the PyTorch project, uh, and we have a dedicated uh, PM, technical PM, in support of the project and the foundation. And we have a lot of efforts that are being in flight in terms of transitioning the project assets from Meta, the founder of the project, to the Linux Foundation. And uh, with that, we're almost done. I mean, there's like a few, uh, couple items that are pending, but pretty much we're there. And we kind of put in an agenda for what our focus would be in 2023. And of course beyond, but I think we're starting with 2023, where we have a lot of efforts being either announced or in the process of being announced in terms of uh, supporting the developers in the project, uh, increasing the number of developers contributing to the project, uh, bringing in new developers, uh, providing tools for better workflows. We have programs in relation to marketing, uh, PR and communication. Uh, we started a training program, so we have uh, in progress developer training that will be available via Linux platform and edX. Uh, similar, for example, to CNCF, which is really a great example to follow. Uh, we are also working on a certification program for PyTorch developers, um, enabling PyTorch on additional uh, hardware and platforms. And one very uh, key area for PyTorch is its relationship with academia. Uh, so there's really a lot of emphasis from the project founders and the members of the PyTorch Foundation on uh, deep involvement with academia and research. And we're working on programs that we'll be announcing very soon with this respect. And I think the cherry on, on the ice cream, if you wish, is uh, we are very close to announcing that PyTorch Foundation is open to accept new members. Uh, as you know, we, we started with the initial six founding members um, to give us kind of a chance to establish the foundation and its parameters and its operation. And we are finalizing the structure to welcome new members. So I think in about a month, a month and a half, we will see that announcement. And at that point, 
uh, we will be able to welcome and onboard the new members to the foundation. And from there on, it's just basically, um, you know, more members, more technical projects and initiatives within the PyTorch project, uh, more initiatives from marketing perspective, from training, from certification, and all of it is in support of growing the project and its community. And as you're talking about, you know, your drive for more members, talk a bit about, you know, who are the exiting members and how they are involved with the project. When the PyTorch Foundation was established, we had six founding members that included uh, Meta, AMD, Microsoft, Google, uh, AWS, and NVIDIA. And um, the premise was, instead of focusing on building a portfolio of 20, 30 companies, uh, joining the foundation and announcing a foundation with so many members, we realized that it takes actually a lot of efforts and a lot of time to rally the companies to provide the quotes and agree on a press release and you know all the different logistics and signing the agreements and so on. So it takes a really significant amount of time. So we opted for announcing the foundation with the initial six founding members and opted and left all the kind of organizational uh, activities in relation to the foundation structure to a later point uh, so that we can be very fast to market in a sense we can announce the foundation right away without having to wait for all the logistical items to be executed. So now uh, we're doing this interview here uh, in Vancouver in you know May 2023 and I believe within a month, a month and a half or so we will be announcing that we are ready to uh, welcome new members. And of course, when we welcome new members, there's a specific onboarding process we have to go to, basically in terms of online agreements, DocuSign um, um, bringing in um, uh, the individuals from these different organizations, plugging them on the mailing list, on Zoom. So there's like a whole automation that needs to happen and we are actually in the process of implementing this. So today, the six founding members are involved in two ways. The first one is on the board of the foundation. Uh, and the second is via the marketing committee. So about two months after starting the foundation, we established the marketing committee whose uh, mission is really to promote the project via different marketing program uh, that the foundation will establish. And each of these founding members designate a representative to this committee. Uh, and we're seeing actually a lot of um, documentation being created. We're seeing, um, for example, yesterday on May 9, we had a PyTorch mini summit. Uh, we're announcing uh, actually, we already announced the PyTorch conference that will take place in October in San Francisco. We have multiple PyTorch mini summits happening throughout the year. So there's really a lot of activities and all of that uh, really is driven by the PyTorch Foundation uh, as in support of the project itself. Of course, we are at an event, so I do want to ask about, you know, if you have any plans to have any events also for the foundation or the project. Yeah, so the Anchor project or the main flagship project uh, event is the PyTorch conference. So last year we had it in New Orleans in December, actually December 2nd. And this year we are uh, holding the event in San Francisco in October, I think October 16, 17. And that is really uh, the event that brings in together, you know, data scientists using PyTorch, developers contributing to the project, organizations using the project, bring them together under this umbrella, exchange technical advancement, uh, exchange best practices, and exchange ideas on how to continue and, and flourish uh, the technical uh, project itself. So if you are using, contributing, deploying PyTorch, this is really a, a must-attend event in this respect. You also work on a lot of reports that keep coming out. So talk a bit about any you know, major reports or research work that you did in 2023, some key findings there. I like to write. And <laughs> uh, actually, this is a part of, you know, I, I completed a PhD in computer science. And part of that training is learning how to write. I mean, you know, you need to write a thesis that's like maybe 300 pages. And before that, your master thesis, that's another, you know. So basically over time, uh, you you start using writing as a way to, um, you know, to, to exchange information and to pass knowledge. And at the Linux Foundation, I'm very involved with the uh, Linux Foundation research team. So on a yearly basis, I publish maybe anywhere between three to five different reports. Um, so the last couple of reports I wrote this year, one of them was focused on uh, OSPOs, open source program offices, and the other one was focused on GitHub best practices. 
Um, and I'll start with the second one. So in LFA and data, we host today uh, 49 projects. And all of these projects come to us. And part of the onboarding into the foundation, we recommend a number of activities that the project has to implement or, uh, or, uh, or execute so that um, they become eligible for hosting with us. And some of these activities or tasks are related to GitHub. So a lot of projects come to us, they have, for example, poor documentation on GitHub. They don't have uh, security measures put in place. Um, um, they have uh, some of their settings are not fine-tuned. Uh, they don't have a DCO app running on, on the code. So there's really a lot of improvements that can be implemented. And the premise uh, first was, you know, I'm going to write a two-pager that every time we have a project coming into the foundation, I give them this page and I tell them, hey, you know, I'd like you to go and implement these different measures to improve your presence on GitHub. And over time, you know, for the past two years, I've been adding to it more tasks and more tasks. And eventually it came to be like four or five pages. And I'm thinking, hey, you know, this, this might be a great idea for a report. So I took that and I expanded on it. And now we have like a 30 page report that's really anyone, you don't have to be hosting your project for the foundation. If you have a project on GitHub and you want to make sure that you improve the security of the project, you improve the documentation, you improve the visibility of the project, uh, you have better settings, you know, et cetera, I would encourage you to download that report and view it and really actually go and implement the recommendations. It will just make your life in managing the project um, a lot better and easier. So this is kind of one of the examples. And the other aspect uh, or the other report is the open source program office. And again, you know, all of my publications are driven from practical experience, right? From being a practitioner. So I've, I've created the OSPO at Samsung Electronics. I participated in the Motorola OSPO. I created the Ericsson OSPO back in the early 2000s, uh, participated in the HP OSPO, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I've had um, visibility to many different OSPOs in um, large companies, small companies, in startup environments. So I decided to, hey, you know, collect all of this kind of information and produce a report that focuses on, you know, what is an OSPO, how can it run, uh, you know, what are the roles and responsibilities, uh, and some lessons learned across the different experiences that I've had. Um, and what's really interesting is that report, for instance, was translated to, uh, to Chinese and to Japanese as well. Uh, and um, I've built a workshop based on this that I've delivered the workshop uh, last year in Shanghai, and I'm um, I'm actually targeting to deliver it at the uh, Open Source Summit in Spain uh, later this year. Uh, and all of these is uh, really a collection of experiences that um, will help others see the mistakes that we've made in some of the OSPOs and how we were able to recover and proceed, and also highlight some of the success stories. So, and the idea of all of that is, you know, if you are coming new into that space and you want to establish an OSPO, we want you to be the most effective um, person to establish an OSPO. We want you to look back at our experiences, learn from our mistakes and learn from our success stories. And instead of taking you, you know, five years to build an effective operation and, you know, and, and be very well known in the space, we want you to down, you know, from go down from like five to three or to two. So basically, bringing all that knowledge and unpacking it, making it available to everybody. Ibrahim, thank you so much for taking time out today. And of course, talk about the PyTorch Foundation, talk about the you know AI data, and of course, you know your, your reports and writing. Uh, as usual, I would love to sit down and chat with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Swapna. My pleasure.